actually grows a disciple until he can multiply. Because we're going to be talking about the multiplication. We want to note that multiplication, uh, as wonderful as the word is, if it has to be of life, it only comes by growth. Isn't it? Eh? A plant can never multiply itself unless it has done what? It has grown. Amen. So we're going to be looking at what grows, what, what brings multiplication onto the life of a disciple. We, we dealt with what produces genuine disciples, isn't it? We're now going to be looking at what is it that makes a disciple as an individual to multiply. We're going to be looking at what multiplies a disciple's life. Shall we pray together? Let's pray. Our Father, this night we, one more time, uh, look to you to bring us light. You have shown us that even though you are speaking to us about multiplication, you have shown us that the kind of multiplication you are looking for is not a reduction of quality. It's not an admittance of any kind. It is not uh, a, you know, a fluffy kind of growth that will bring revival. You are talking to us about the multiplication of disciples of the kind that have taken time to come to you and to take your life in as the content of their lives. And this night, Lord, as we go ahead to look at what is it that multiplies a disciple, we ask that you will open our understanding. You will release to us such, inst such instruction from the Word of God. Please help us as we go on tonight. And show us mercy, cause your word to mix with faith in our hearts. In Jesus' name we are prayed. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. We are looking at what is it that multiplies disciples. And again, I want you to note that Throughout today, I will be first and foremost focusing on you as we began in the morning. How can my life multiply? How can my life multiply? How will I not be stagnant? How will I be able to produce a uh, of my own kind in multiples. That's what we want to look at as the Lord will guide us. Uh, our text has been from Acts chapter 6 and verse 7. But like I started in the morning, I will again take some two other texts that I will build into as we are reading the scriptures together. The Lord will help us in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 6. And I'll read verse 7, which was our text. But then I will take you a bit back as we build tonight. Then the word of God spread. And the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. And a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. The word of God spread. The word of God increased. That was how Old King James Version put it. And the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. Can you get me an Old King James Bible there? Old King James. 
and a great many of the priests. Thank you. Were obedient. They became obedient to the faith. Praise the Lord. So we are looking at what is it that multiplies disciples. Now, before we come to study this, let's take a few scriptures from the uh, gospel and then we shall go on from there. Turn your Bibles to John chapter 12. Turn your Bibles to John 12. Few passages that you are going to be uh, grappling with as we go on. John and chapter 12. When you get to John 12, I'd like you to quickly go to verse 20, 20, very quickly to 26. And there were certain Greeks among them that came up to worship at the feast. Are you in John 12, 20? Eh? All right. The same came therefore to Philip, which was of Bethsaida of Galilee, and desired him, saying, Sir, we will see Jesus. Philip comes and tells Andrew, and Andrew again, and Philip tells Jesus. And Jesus answered them, saying, The hour is come. That the Son of Man should be glorified. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat falls into the ground and die, it abides alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. He that loveth his life shall lose it. And he that ate his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. If any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. Go to chapter 15 and we read another passage before we begin our study. John chapter 15. Are you in John chapter 15? Right. Right. In verse 1, I am the, the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth no fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purges it. That he may do what? May bring forth more fruit. Verse 5. I am divine, you are the branches. He that abides in me, and I in him, the same bring, bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Praise the Lord. We are looking at what brings multiplication to a disciple. What is it that multiplies a disciple? May I first note that when the scriptures said in John, I mean in Acts chapter 6 that and the number of disciples were multiplied. There are two dimensions in which we need to understand that. Number one, 
each of the disciples themselves, each one of them multiplied. Is that okay? And all of the disciples together, all of them together multiplied. Now before we talk about their corporate multiplication, we must talk about their individual multiplication. Are we together now? Now, so we are dealing with what is it that will make you as an individual person to do what? To multiply. What will make your life to sprout and to produce and produce in multiples? What is it that will make the grace of God in your life to multiply? What is it that will make the, the anointing on your life to multiply? What is it that will make your life to become effective in multiplication? What is it that will not allow you to remain stagnant or to remain withered or to, re to dry up? What is that thing that will not allow you to be alone? That after several years that you have said you have followed Jesus or you have become his disciple, you are still alone. Nothing has, has increased about you. Nothing has been added to you as a person that makes your life robust. One of the things that has made the church to be stagnant is because individual members, they are barren. Are you, are you getting what I'm talking about? If you are keeping a set of animals and for years they have not been able to reproduce if they were 10 and in 5 years they are still 10 what do you think made them to be 10? it is that each one of them is what? is barren has not produced there are churches that are barren isn't it? there are congregations the only time they talk about increase is if somebody went and got married and brought a wife inside. But when their girls decided to marry someone from another denomination, they would be so sad. Why are they sad? Eh? It would be a reduction. Say, so you don't see anybody in this church to marry? Why are you going somewhere that you want to reduce our number? Sometimes the only time they think that they have grown is when they have a child. And we know that the fact that you are pregnant and you deliver a baby does not make your baby a child of God. Oh, you are not with me at all. So when they say disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, they were not saying that they married more wives so they have increased their number that's not the that's not the strength of their growth they were not saying that oh this woman has delivered twins so now we are multiplied it is not that disciples don't multiply because somebody gave birth to another child naturally oh my god are you hearing me now when church began to develop, I mean depend on such kind of multiplication, either by getting wives or by having children, and they say our church is growing because now the number of children in the church, they are now 200 because our, our women are just delivering children. They think that those 200 children are members of the church and that they are members of the kingdom of God, that's a mistake. Those who become disciples, they were not such that were born naturally. 
They were born by the Spirit. Disciples don't multiply because they were born naturally or they married another woman. And it is not a multiplication because people migrated. You are not hearing what I'm saying. You know there are times that maybe some people have migrated from Durban and they have come to Umtada. And so they joined the church. They say, well, thank God our church is growing. We are actually multiplying. Is there any multiplication there? What was it? There was a migration. Migration, a reduction from somewhere else. And as they have migrated to you, they will migrate again. So you see, God doesn't rejoice that his church has grown in any particular place because people migrated. I hope I'm laying the foundation for what I want to deal with tonight. Are you getting what I'm talking about now? We don't say disciples are multiplied simply because they move from one fellowship to come and join another fellowship and in the fellowship where they used to be they have depleted and in the new fellowship they join they have increased that has nothing to do with the kingdom multiplication it's ordinary migration please listen to me I know I'm talking I'm dealing with something here there are several of you that have moved from one thing to another, from one thing to another. And if you look at you, oh, there's progress. No, there's no progress. There is only what? Movement. Migration. It's a recirculation. And sometimes I see some of you, you are being in a Baptist church. It's not because anything changed. It's just that you didn't like the pastor that was there. Then you moved to uh, Umtata Pentecostal Assembly. And as you have migrated to that place, it looks as if the place swelled up. And one other day they carried another pastor from the Pentecostal Assembly. And you don't like that one. You say, these people are not serious. That's my man that they are taking away. Wherever he goes, I'll follow him. So when he moved from the Ntata Pentecostal Assembly and he went to form Ntata Serious Pentecostal Assembly and he announced and said, those of you that are serious Pentecostals, you come here. And you also moved. And you say, yes. The, the, the church is marching on. The gate of hell shall not prevail against it. Where is it marching to? There's nothing about that. So we are talking about multiplication that is not about migration. Multiplication that is not about natural addition of babies or of wives. We are talking about multiplication that is not of movement from one segment of the body of Christ to another. We are honestly looking and believing God that disciples will do what? We multiply greatly. That God is going to bring such an increase. But I want to first know that the increase is first and foremost before it becomes a corporate increase is first an individual multiplication are we together now it is if i multiply if something has happened to me and i grew more than i used to be and it is not a replacement of another brother is that okay it is not a cheating of another brother. It is a genuine outbreak of the grace of God in my life. 
that has brought an increase, increase even to me, increase to my work with God, increase to my reproduction. That's what we are looking for when they say disciples multiply. Do you understand that? When by God's grace tomorrow, I will be dealing with that in the matter of how to grow discipleship. How to multiply disciples. When I come to that, I'll be dealing with what you yourself will be doing. But for tonight, I'm dealing with what is it that multiplies you. Imagine that if each one of you something happens in you and your experience of God multiplies such that as you open your mouth to speak to someone that person could not ignore you and said your life is so affecting me that I cannot do otherwise than become like what God has made you that's the kind of multiplication that we're looking for. So, let's quickly study what is it that will bring multiplication to a disciple as an individual. And I want to spend a bit of time dealing with that, believing that it will sink into your spirit as an individual. Now, it was Jesus Christ that himself was first facing the challenge of multiplication for himself. This is Jesus himself talking about multiplication of himself. And this is what he said. In that John chapter 12, we were told when Jesus Christ was riding on the on the earth, people came were singing and certain Greeks among the people that came up to worship in the feast came that they wanted to see Jesus. So they came and met Philip. Philip of the side of Galilee and desired him saying, Sir, we want to see Jesus. And Philip quickly came and told Andrew and said, Andrew, this honorable man from Greek, they wanted to see the master. And Andrew and Philip, they came to meet Jesus and said, Sir, some important philosophers from Greek are here to pay homage to you. They wanted to see you, sir. Now, I want you to hear me. And I want you to hear it very well. And I'm praying that those of you that are sitting here, you know, I said to you yesterday, you are only seeds for what God is about to do. Do you remember? That all of you sitting here, what did I call you? You are seeds for the coming move of God. But then we need to deal with what will make that seed to multiply. And here was Jesus showing us how he himself intended to multiply, to multiply his life. So when these people came, Jesus said to them, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. What does that mean? That if Jesus wanted to assert himself and collect the applause and the glory that people were bringing to him, it was his right. And it was correct. And he could have called for, for those Greeks and they would say, yes sir, we have heard about you. We just wanted to hear your wisdom. And he would have put his hand in his pocket as an achiever. But he knew something else. See what he said. 
See what he said. And Jesus answered them saying, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except a corn of wheat falls into the ground and die. What does it do? It abides alone. But if it dies, it bringeth forth much fruit. I want us to do a little, a little, a little agric here. I know you all know about maize. You know maize? What we call corn. How many of you have planted maize before? Let me see your hand up. Oh, this is great. This is, I mean, a good class. Good class. Now, when you put one grain of maize into the soil and it grows, does it produce only one grain of maize? What does it produce? Eh? Tell me. Yes, sir. It will produce a cup with several, several grains. Some of the cups can be very long. And if you were to, you know, bring out all the grains, one cup, say what say, what is the average number of grains on a cup? It depends on size. It can fill a cup. So one small grain that has been allowed to be buried and has experienced disintegration in death and germinated will produce not just one other grain. It can produce a cup that will fill a cup. It could be in hundreds. One. Such that if you now carry it, a bowl of maize and you plant it on the farm, what are you expecting to get? Maybe bags. You may get several bags. Several sacks of maize. So Jesus Christ was laying a very critical principle for multiplication. And let's understand it. He said, unless the corn of wheat falls to the ground and dies, what does it do? It abides. It remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. He who loves his life will lose it. And he who hates his life in this world will do what? We keep it for eternal life. Now that is the first issue that Jesus Christ himself applied directly to his own life and I want you to hear me very well. Are you hearing me very well? Do we plant a maize grain because the grain is not good? Talk to me. Actually, if you were to plant a maize grain, a grain that has already been infected, Maybe by, by a pest or something that has eaten it up. Weevils. If you should plant it, will it produce anything? So let me note to you that death that multiplies the grain is not because the grain is sick. Or that the grain 
is bad. Are you hearing me? The death that brings multiplication is not a death by accident. It is an intentional death. And it's not a death because I don't like this life. I don't like this grain. It's because I love this kind of grain. And I want more of it. Lord, am I communicating with you? The Lord will help us in the name of Jesus Christ. So, what does that mean? The Lord Jesus Christ went ahead and said, Unless the, the corn, the grain of wheat, falls to the ground and dies, even though it is good, it abides alone. It cannot multiply as long as it has been preserving itself. It cannot multiply as long as it remains selfish. Multiplication is not possible with self-preservation. Those who seek to preserve themselves, they cannot multiply. What actually would they do? They will remain alone and after some time, they will lose. Can I ask, if you decide to keep your maize, you don't want to plant it. You decide to keep it. Those of you that are experienced, how long can you keep those grains of maize before they get spoiled? Just one season. By the end of that one season, what has happened to them now? They have finished. Things have come to chop them. Not only that things have come to chop them, they have become so string. They have become smaller and harder. That when you want to eat it, it has no taste. Are you together with me? How many of you can eat dry meat? No taste. Even when you decide to grind it, it doesn't have much nutrient. When you sift it, you get more chaff. Do you know why? You have over-preserved it. Whatever seeks to keep itself and does not want to release itself can only reduce it cannot multiply this is biblical principle so let's look now what must happen to me so that my life will be on a constant multiplication it means that I must deliberately, deliberately, not accidentally, deliberately release my life to be planted. I must release my life. Please take note, I'm first even dealing with a life that is good. A life that is useful. But if I don't want it to remain alone, I must submit it to what? To death. Unless the corn of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it abides alone. But if it dies, if it dies, it bringeth forth much fruit. Brothers and sisters, Disciples only multiplied, as we are going to see in the Acts of Apostles, when each of the disciples agreed to do what? To die. 
Oh my God. Are we together? Disciples multiplied in Jerusalem because each one of the disciples themselves agreed to do what? To die. To die to self. To die with their self preservation. To die to their self protection. To die to their self ambition. That was what multiplied them. Death. Now, will I raise a few issues quickly about death that multiplies a disciple? Number one. Number one. Number one. That grain of wheat or of corn that we produce plenty, the first thing you do to it is to make sure that those weevils, those termites, those little, little insects that want to eat it, what do you do to those insects first? You kill them. You are not with me. If you allow the grain to be eaten up by those little, little insects or what you call pests or whatever name you give them, what happens to your grains? They become empty even before you plant it. Even now, if you now decide to go and offer such grains that are already perforated and eaten up, if you plant it, will it produce anything? Why will it not produce anything? Because there is nothing inside of it. Again, they are being eaten up. Hey, are we together? May I say something to you? Some of you are willing to even lay down your life for death. But your life is already emptied. Something has eaten you up. God so said, I surrender my life. I surrender my life. God said, what are you surrendering? Empty, empty container. Perforated. There is nothing in it. It cannot produce. So the first death that you need to make sure happens is the death of everything that perforates Christ's life inside of you. And the first thing that does it is sin. What did I say? Sin. Sin. Sin is that little thing that comes into your life. When it attacks a life, it, it draws from it every nutrient for multiplication. Let me tell you, a sinner has no life to multiply. A sinner can only bring more confusion to the kingdom of God. A preacher who is committing sin secretly has no life to multiply. He can only bring more infection to many lives. So the first thing that you must die to, you must be dead to sin. When a man of God is not dead to sin, are you hearing me? His ministry has no future. Sin is a terrible pest. And it goes to attack the nutrients. Can you imagine how Satan was targeting Peter? Eh? Do you know Satan was targeting Peter? And Jesus said, Satan has desired to have you. That he may sift you like wheat. 
when you sift wheat, what do you what are you left with? What are you left with? Chaff, chaff, chaff. Look, when Satan sees a man of God, Satan says, "What can we do to sift him so that he can become chaff?" He will not say you should not preach. Are you hearing me? You can be preaching, but what are you preaching? Chaff. You can read Bible, but what gives the Bible content and ingredient for multiplication is the life of the preacher. But when the life of a preacher has been perforated and he has been sifted and he has been left with empty charms, whatever he says is empty. It doesn't touch and it carries no life. So Satan was targeting. Look at Peter that would have been a wonderful man of God. Satan said, let's sift him. Let's sift him. Let's reduce him. Let's collect whatever is inside of him. So that he will be child. Do you know that some of us, there are beautiful songs on your lips. Very beautiful songs. But your song cannot multiply anything. Because the singer, the singer is a child. Do you know the Bible said the word of God is hammer? Eh? But let me tell you. Hammer is wonderful. But you know that hammer cannot break anything by itself unless the man who carries it has enough strength to hit. Oh my God, are we together? So you see, what makes the word of God either light or heavy in affecting people's lives is not first located there, it's located in the carrier. So when the life of a man that is trying to preach the word of God had been sifted, had been perforated, had been evacuated of his ingredients, and he himself has become light, lightweight, like feather, no matter what he preaches, he cannot multiply. Because there is nothing there. So what is the first thing that the servant, a disciple that wants to multiply his own life must first deal with? Death to sin. You must become dead to sin. Sin is the thing the devil has discovered that will reduce you to nothing. When he saw how Adam was working with God and was being effective in demonstrating the life of God, he said, what can we do to, to reduce this man? To reduce his effectiveness. He sponsored sin into his life. Sin. Brothers, I'm telling you, no matter how mighty your ministry is, give sin a little chance. Quietly, it will eat you up. Sin is a voracious insect. It's voracious. It doesn't start eating from outside. If he eats from outside, are you hearing me? We will have seen the danger of it and we will have dealt with it. But sin does not eat from outside. Sin begins from where nobody can see it. And begins to eat inside. Eat inside. Eat inside. Eat inside. It will leave the outside shape 
intact. Because he is not interested on the outside. Honestly speaking, can I inform you that what actually multiplies in a seed is not the outside cover. Eh? Do you know that the outside cover is only a cover? The life of the seed is actually the inside. And that's what seed targets. So for you to multiply, if you are a disciple indeed, we cannot be joking about sin. And I want to talk to you, public sin is not as dangerous as secret sin. Public sin is a little thing. In fact, if I see a man that is committing sin publicly, do you know that he is not a problem? Do you know why? Everybody will pray for him. Many people will cancel him. And once they see him coming, they say, we know that this man usually falls into this sin. Let us not allow all of those things to be around him. But secret sin, secret sin that makes you appear holy on the outside, secret sin, imperceptible decay in the heart, a decay that people cannot see, that one is much more voracious, much more dangerous. Friends, if the sin of preachers are public, it will have been easy. Ever before you see a man of God fall, I tell you he has fallen 1,000 times in the secret. But you know why? The power of sin the secret of sin, the secret of the effectiveness of sin, is the secrecy. Are you hearing me? The reason why you conquer sin when you confess is because as soon as you confess, that is, you open up sin, sin already lost its power. Because the power of sin is in its secrecy. Oh my God. Are you hearing me? Secret sin, I say, is more powerful, more voracious than public sin. And in the same way, can I tell you, secret prayer, secret praying, is more effective than public prayer. But do you know what happens? You don't want me to tell you what happens? When sin is coming to your life, he comes secretly and he attacks your secret praying. The secret place of prayer, that's where the secret thing quickly goes to attack. And you can see that there are many people, many of you, you pray very well in the public. When you are alone, you sleep off. When you are alone, wandering thoughts. You need them like this. You are praying, but your mind has gone to East London. Why? Because the devil knows that public praying is of little power. So he would like you to focus on what does not affect him in any sense. So can I say to you now, secret compromise, secret lying, secret relationships,
secret habit. Secret addiction. Those are the things that goes for the ingredients of the seed that could multiply. So you see so many Christians, they cannot multiply because they have been secretly devoured. They have been secretly, secretly, secretly perforated and have been sifted. Something has been drawn from their life. I wish all of you, the way you are serious in this meeting, is the way you are serious secretly. Things will have happened. We will have moved. The devil will have been shivering. So the first thing that will make you to multiply is to deal with secret sin. You are not only going to be dead to public sin. You know, some of you, when sin is public, you don't want to be involved in it because you don't even like the disgrace. Eh? You are not hearing me. You tell us, we are all here now. Some of you don't, you don't like to fight because it's a disgrace. How can they say? You are fighting. It's a disgrace. But don't you fight in the heart? Don't you be a quiet grudge? And you don't know that secret bitterness is more bitter than physical fight. I want to move away quickly from there. These disciples that multiplied their lives, and the Bible said the number of disciples multiplied. One thing has happened to them. They were individually dead to sin. So that the ingredient of Christ's life in them has been preserved. They were dead to sin. And let me say, unless you are dead to sin, sin will rob you. I don't see any discipleship that will overrun South Africa until the question of secret sin had been dealt with. You know, some of you are sisters here today. Young sisters that dance and praising God. When you get engaged with that young boy, do you keep your purity? Do you maintain yourself and say, no sex before marriage? You say, well, you know... After all, we are going to marry. You are going to marry is not equal to marriage. And you don't know that as soon as you do that, you have favorated your life. You can multiply again. Because you are a virgin only once. You lose it, you lost it. The unfortunate challenge is that even now when you get married, you don't have the moral courage to correct your children. You are not hearing me. When your child is going out with a boy, every time you want to call her, say, don't do this. Something will hold your throat from inside and say, what of you? What of you? What did you do when you were there? 
So suddenly, instead of multiplying holiness in that young girl, you have to say, well, you know, we know that, you know, as young people, there are all these problems, and uh, we fall into it once a while, but just be careful. How can that kind of message change a life? It lacks power. It lacks the force of reproduction. Because you were perforated and sifted. But you know you can recover. You know you can recover. Let me tell you how you can. When you have repented genuinely, you have pleaded with God and said, God, there's nothing to hide again. And then you call your daughter. You say, let me tell you something. I have never told you this, but I want to tell you today. Do you know? It took me seven years after I had graduated to get somebody to marry. Because just before we finish university, just like you are going up and down like this, that was how I went. And I remember this Mr. 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 Swana. Whom I fell into his hand and disbarred me. And I had a baby. That baby, you don't know him, is in the village now. That was why I didn't do my master's. I got admission. But that baby came along the way. I dropped out. You see me doing all this petty petty job. That is what caused it. I'm ashamed to tell you. But that was what wrecked my life. You see how your father comes and beats me all the time. Because I have no moral courage to look at his face. I wasn't sure anybody would be able to marry me again. So when your father came around. I was just trying to use my body to bribe him. That's why my marriage has not worked. I know I cannot undo it. But God has forgiven me. That's why I'm not ashamed to tell you. I don't want you to go the way I went. Do you know that? That will now carry power. Your child will repent and say, Ah, mommy! So this is the reason why we all suffered. I don't want my own children to do so. She will repent. But you see, you don't understand. That some of you say you have repented, but you, have, you are still covering sin. The reason is because the power of sin is in its cover. Secret thing is the power of sin. So those things that you have not been able to explain and say very plainly, some of your daughters, you have never told them. Some of them, they don't know their father. The person you introduce to them as their father is not their father. And you have been afraid. Now, we have such people here in discipleship. How can they multiply? God has forgiven us. But we've got to deal with that secret that is digging at your root all the time. All the time. All the time. All the time. And you know why? Shame is like death. Many people
people prefer, prefer to go away than to face the shame of confessing their old life. And you don't know that until you die. You must die to shame. One of the things that Jesus died to, let me tell you, the Bible said, for the joy that was set before him. What did he do? He endured the cross. Doing what? Despising the shame. A man who is so sensitive to shame cannot grow. Because you are overprotective. You are always protecting something. You are very defensive because you are always hiding something. It makes you to exaggerate what has not happened. It makes you to tell lies. It makes you to be hiding. You play hide and seek. What is it that made the disciples to multiply? They were dead to shame. They were dead to sin. I want to inform you. Do you know that your life will affect people very fast when, number one, you are dead to sin? Or number two, you are also dead to shame, the shame of sin. To the point that, yes, you are not ashamed to stand up and tell people, I was a sinner going to hell until Jesus came my way. I was hopeless Confused and lost until his hand drew me out from the merry clay. I was a sinner, saved only by grace. And I'm a sinner, hanging on his love. I'm a sinner. By grace. You don't want to confess. You don't want to tell the truth. If as a man of God you fail, instead of using all kind of method to cover up, confess. God will forgive you. And your ears will grow again. Then your life will multiply. But sin says, don't tell anybody. Pray quietly about it. People will spoil your ministry if you tell them. So you find yourself traveling with a load of guilt. Your head is always bent. You are always sensitive to who knows what. Sometimes you are preaching or you are somewhere. Somebody that knows your story is there. And when your eyes meet with his eyes, you can't talk again. You become a stammerer. And sometimes say, well, if you want me to talk, I will talk. Then you go and renegotiate with him and say, no, it's not like that. He say, okay, if you know it's not like that, you should not be pushing some of us. We are all the same. We know ourselves. So your message finished. So when you see him sitting with some people there and they are talking, you are you are shivering. What 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 what?